Have you ever wondered if you could skip ahead on the goals and dreams you have by taking techniques of experimentation to help your dreams in your life come true? That's what we'll talk about today. Science, my boy, is made up of mistakes, but they are mistakes which is useful to make because they lead us little by little to the truth. Jules Verne, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Today, we're going to talk about a book by James Altucher called Skip the Line, The 10,000 Experiment Rule and Other Surprising Advice for Reaching Your Goals. It's no secret that I like James Altucher. And in fact, he had a lot to do with me deciding to do podcasting. And he has his own podcast. And some of the time he talks about how to do interesting things like have a podcast or write a book. He believes that these are all cost-free ways to try something. What's the worst thing that will happen if it doesn't work out? Nothing. You just tried something, you learned a lesson from it, and you can keep going on. And for whatever reason, the way he talks about it gets to my brain. It makes so much sense to me. I can always tell when I listen to a podcast that talks about this because I am just buzzing with ideas for like the next two weeks after that. I like him. I think he's an interesting fellow. And I think that he is the guy who always is looking for opportunities. And so that's why I wanted to talk about one of his books, because I think he is onto something when it comes to us getting our goals. In his book, he's trying to tell us the things that we need to do in order to get some of our goals. And he says that, first of all, the 1% a day improvement is critical for all of this. That's something that James Clear talked about in Atomic Habits that if we just get 1% better every day, we will make a significant improvement all the time. It's important for us to figure out how we can just become 1% better in the things that we're trying to do. But he says that the important thing here is that we set up small experiments in our lives. There was a famous quote that talked about how in order to become a master of something, you need to do 10,000 hours of practice. And then it got fuzzier and someone said, no, 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 it's not just 10,000 hours of practice. It's 10,000 hours of directed practice. So you just can't play a violin. You have to play the violin using certain skills that will make you better. And what he's saying is that it's not true at all, that he would rather you do 10,000 experiments to make yourself better, not 10,000 hours of practice. And what I like about this is how he frames it in a sense that when you set up these experiments, you're going to learn a lot. Whether you succeed or fail, you will know something new. And it's really easy to do. He talks about how he ended up doing this really weird thing, which was to take the book Twilight and write another book that was almost entirely based on the book Twilight. Like he was rewriting the book Twilight. And then he sold it as his own book. And it didn't do very well because he was doing it as an experiment. And so does he feel that that was a loss because he took a silly idea, worked on it, and it didn't do very well? No, he said that he learned about the whole world of self-publishing. He learned how it worked. He learned a few lessons about why his book didn't work and Twilight did work. All sorts of ideas were there because he was willing to do this very weird experiment. But it taught him something. When you're trying to set up these experiments, the first thing you want to make sure is that it's easy to do, it's easy to set up. So this is not a very complicated process that you're doing. If you're trying to write a book, it's fairly easy to self-publish on Amazon, for example. You can just publish these books without much of an investment at all, and you can learn something. Or if you're trying to set up a website, it's not too terribly hard to do. So how can you take these small experiments that are easy and quick to do and try them out? He says the next step is, and in these experiments, is making sure that there's very little downside in that. You're not trying to experiment with your health. You're not trying to experiment with uh, dangerous things in your life, because if you do something dangerous, there's a huge downside to it. But if you're just writing a book, setting up a website, creating a podcast, Whatever your little experiment is in life, maybe you're just writing up a resume, that's your small experiment. There's no cost in that. If it didn't work out, nothing would be lost on it. You know, for example, if you wanted to start up an experiment to find a new job, 
write up a resume and just start applying to jobs for it. Ones that you have no intention of getting. You know, ones that you think that it'd be cool if you got it, but don't tell yourself that. Just say, I'm going to send my resume out to these companies and just see if anyone answers back. Because so many people are looking for employees right now. Maybe it's actually going to work. There's no downside to it, right? You're not accepting the job. You may go in for an interview, but there's no harm. There's no downside of you just going in for an interview. Or there's no harm with you just setting up a website and selling your artwork on it. You know, there's very easy experiments that nothing bad would happen if you tried it out. And then he said the last rule for your experiment is there's a huge potential upside. So if you just sent out your resume to 10 companies just to see what would happen, huge upside. Maybe you will get the job you want. If you decided to write a small book and sell it, maybe it will take off. You don't know. He says another good sign of a good experiment is that it's never been done before. Don't write a book like he did where he wrote a book based on someone else's book. Try writing a book that no one else has done. Or if you decide that you're going to come up with your own product and sell it on a store, what's something that you could make that no one's really made before? And the last step to having a great experiment is make sure that you're learning something, whether it's successful, not successful, you have learned a valuable lesson about something. And you want to learn something new if you take this on. And he said, in the end, there's only two outcomes to these experiments. One, you succeed. Two, you learn something. There is no such thing as failure. And he said that when we were kids, we experimented all the time. We tried this game. We played this experiment. We tried to do something new. We were curious human beings as children. And something happens when we get older that we get more afraid of things, that we maybe lose our motivation or we lose our interest in learning something new. And so he said that if we want to skip the line, which is his book, that means we're going to have to step out, out of the line, out of our comfort zone and start doing those things. Be more like a kid where you were adventurous and willing to try things. And he said in the end that, you know, sometimes we get nervous about doing these things because we worry about what other people will think. And he wonders, why do we give other people such a big importance into this decision? Why do we let them decide what it is we're going to do? And I get it from the point of view that, you know, if this is your spouse and you have to make decisions together, that makes sense. But in the end, it doesn't really matter what other people think. He says that whenever we're going to skip the line, we should become a scientist of our own life. And that means that we are going to do those experiments. We're going to investigate things and figure out how we can use our curiosity to get there. He says that it helps, too, to be obsessed with whatever it is that we're going to start our experiment with. If we are obsessed with a particular kind of art, or if we're obsessed with a particular kind of information, how can we take that experiment and our obsession, bring those two together, because our obsession is going to give us that energy we need to do, and that will help us skip the line. By having the combination of those two things, it will give us an experience of either learning or success. And he says in the end that we can only be good about the things that we're obsessed about, because If we're not obsessed about it, we won't have that energy. We won't be excited. We won't be curious. We won't persist at it. As soon as it gets hard, we'll drop it. So he says every day about what his experiment should be, what is he obsessed with, and how can he start pursuing those particular activities? And he gives examples. He talked about Lucille Ball, who really wanted to do certain things and was very persistent about them. But anytime she was given a no, she found a different way around because that inside passion she had for what she was looking for in her life drove her to do the things that she wanted to do. So when she was told she couldn't act, she did modeling. When they discovered her in modeling, then she was able to go and become an actress and eventually run a studio. So her persistence paid off. He says that one of the things that can help us and be one of our best friends when we're setting up these experiments is reading. He said, quote, 
Reading is the most important superpower. It turns you from a normal, mortal civilian into a supernatural vampire. So it's going to give us that strength by doing some research and some reading that will help us jump ahead. We'll be able to stand on the shoulders of other people who learned about what it is we're obsessed with, that we have curiosity about, and that we're going to run experiments about. It will make us leap ahead by taking on the things that people who are experts in a particular area have already learned. He also says that we can find mentors or what he calls virtual mentors. And virtual mentors are anyone who has some experience in doing what it is we're trying to do. So if we're trying to write a book, are there people that we can look towards to help us in that process? I was listening to an interview with Guy Hendricks, who wrote a book that we talked about earlier last year. And he said that when he was looking to write his book, he read a book by Stephen King on how to write books because he used the experience Stephen King already had on how to get a book published. He said that that finding a virtual mentor is going to be someone who's going to help us get a superpower. And by getting these virtual mentors, whether they're real mentors who are going to help us out or they're people we just admire and we're going to look towards them to help us bring our own vision into reality. He says in the end, we just have to try. We have to do things. We actually have to do it. And these experiments are the best way to do because we can't just imagine what we want to do. We just can't plan on what we're going to do all the time. We actually have to do it because you will have your worst days at the beginning because you're new at it. You don't know what you're doing and you haven't found your pace. But by the time you get rolling in it, it will get its groove, it'll get its own voice, and things will get better. But it doesn't get better until you start doing it. And I think that's great advice. And because he thinks it's important that you are obsessed with whatever it is you're working on, how do you find out what you're actually really obsessed with? And Danica Patrick gave him some advice. First of all, she said to ask yourself, how would you structure a perfect day? And like you could wave a magic wand and it would be a perfect day. And if it involved you painting and doing artistic things, that's the thing you're obsessed with. So that's where you can start. Also look to see what kinds of things are on your phone. If they are of a certain topic, well, that's what you're obsessed with. And that's going to help you figure it out. And what gave you the most energy? What really revs you up when you think about doing it? That's going to be a good clue about what it is that you're obsessed with. And another good way of thinking about it is what were you really interested in when you were like from 12 to 15, she says, because sometimes we get really interested in things when we're kids. And because we don't have that uh, filter that adults have that talk us out of doing something, that's maybe something that we're obsessed with, but that we just kind of squashed because it wasn't realistic. And then he talks about trying to lean into your fear. We're all going to have fear when we're starting something new. So you're always going to think, wow, what if people read the book and they hate it? What if they give it terrible reviews? What if I start this podcast and no one listens to it? And he says, in the end, hit publish. Make it happen. Try that experiment. And that once you do it and you just hit publish, do you know how scared I was when I first set up this podcast and I had episode number one? And I was going to hit the magic button that would make podcast number one come alive. Well, first of all, I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to get help from my friend Allison to show me what to do. But the second thing was, I just sat there. Now what? Now I have a podcast. Oh my gosh, I published something. And I just sat there and I couldn't think of anything else for a really long time because, oh my goodness, I I just put a podcast out there. You know what? In the end, if you're thinking about writing a book or selling your art or doing something, just hit publish, whatever that publish is, and make it happen. He says in the end, you're going to have to make yourself successful. Well, you can have teams and you can have people, but he said that he's never met another human being who woke up every morning and said, I can't wait to make James Altucher a huge success today. He had to do that himself. He says what you want to do is he calls exercising the possibility muscle, coming up with different ideas of how you can make things happen. What can you do that would make this a success? And you rummage it around in your brain. And so he says that he starts doing things like 
10 ideas for writing a book. And he will just sit there and run away with it. He is trying to exercise his idea muscle. He is trying to come up with so many creative ideas that his brain gets really good at writing up ideas. And he said that if you do this, you will come up with 3,650 ideas every year. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be great. And some of them are going to be terrible. But the point is not about how great your ideas are. The point is to become more creative and come up better, easier, more frequent ideas all the time. So some of his ideas are funny. Like I said, it's like the 10 books I could write tomorrow, the 10 things I could do tomorrow that would make my podcast a success. And sometimes they're not even related to the thing he's actually working on. And he says in the end, don't be afraid of the wobble. And what he means by that is that when the Wright brothers learned how to fly, the first day they tried it, it didn't fly, it didn't take off, but because that bike he was riding wobbled a bit, that wobble showed them that their strategy was in the right direction. So don't be afraid to wobble. But in the end, he says, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. So again, I really like this book. I like James Altucher. He just kind of connects with me on so many ways that really inspires me. And I hope it inspires you too. So here's my challenge to you. Try to think up one small experiment you can do in your life that would make your life progress better. Something on a small scale that you could just try it out and see how it goes. Our fun entertainment advice of the week comes from Jurassic Park. And of course, Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, don't you see the danger, uh, John, inherent uh, in what you're doing here? Genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. It's hardly appropriate to start hurling oh, generalizations. Yeah, if I may. Um, I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're, that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You know, you read what others had done, and you, and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, I, I don't think you're giving us our due credit. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. And that's the point. Create experiments that don't have huge downsides, like eating all your guests and taking over the world. If you don't have a dangerous experiment, you don't have to worry about the consequences. You can stand on the backs of giants and learn from them through books and education. But just don't clone dinosaurs. Things don't go well in the end. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I hope you have a great week. And remember that you can email me at jillsmallstepspod.com or if you have ideas for the podcast, happy to do a podcast topic about it. Thank you very much.